All right, we'll go ahead and start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Greg Keenan, and I'm the manager of the Accelerator Program at WARP. Um, for those who don't know, the Accelerator Program uh, is a uh, program run by WARF that funds uh, technologies on the UW campus to help drive them to commercialization. So we fund prototypes, demonstrations, field trials. Um, and so this topic today is very relevant for the Accelerator Program because we do sit between the University of Wisconsin-Madison and industry. So this is a very, this is a fantastic way to end our day. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Essential Topics. So I'm going to introduce our um, esteemed panelists here, and I'm going to start from your right. Uh, so we have Dean Kate Vandebosch from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Sitting to her right is uh, Chris Somm, who is the CEO of Abbey Discovery. Um, and then, of course, many of you know Tom Still um, from the uh, president of the Wisconsin Technology Council. And so I'm going to turn this over to um, Pam Yonke, or as her Twitter handle refers to her, as the <laughs> fabulous farm babe. Um, Pam is the farm director uh, for the Wisconsin Farm Report Radio Network. And the topic today is really tying and leveraging an article that, uh, or a paper that Chris and Kate wrote, um, which was really exploring this idea of uh, the, uh, exploring innovation in the Wisconsin idea um, and that'll form the basis of this discussion today. So, yeah. All right, good it's deal. All you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, I'm so used to working without a microphone in a room this small. So, Jake, our AV guy, God bless you, buddy. Let's see how we do on this. Thanks so much for taking time on what suddenly is a summer afternoon on uh, the UW Madison campus. I'm glad to be asked to moderate this uh, panel because it really brings together stories that I am blessed to work on from time to time academics and the fantastic cutting edge research and how business is innovating. Today, what I'd like to do is start off talking with Chris first. I think Chris is one of those people that uh, truly is a great example of what WARF, the College Bag, Life Sciences, and Technology is all about, coming together. But Chris, it didn't come necessarily naturally or quickly. Tell me a little bit about how you suddenly became more aware of, shall we say, the behind the scenes activities on the College Bag and Life Sciences. Is this on? There. You got it. All right, I'm supposed to be right up close and personal with the <laughs> microphone. Um, so several years ago, the, uh, the dean of the College of Agriculture at the time, Kate's predecessor, uh, Molly John, invited a group of industry folks to come in and provide advice uh, to the College of Agriculture on what to do with the meat science and muscle biology program. And with that invitation, I felt very comfortable coming to campus, meeting a whole bunch of folks, and then I took from that the extended invitation to personally visit with uh, researchers and staff on campus. And that's really um, was, a, was an important step for me just to continue to get to become more familiar. As an industry person who hadn't really been to campus since, uh, maybe graduating in 1975, uh, to get reintroduced to the folks on campus uh, was a critical step. What surprised you the most? Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> was it the projects that you were suddenly getting a chance to look at? Was it how far along some of the research had been? Or maybe the areas of emphasis? No, I, I, I uh, got a little emotional there, and, and still am, because one of the things that surprised me most was, was Mark Cook. Um, Mark is, uh, is with us in spirit, not physically, but Mark is a great example of other staff members, uh, researchers. I mean, you could just go list the... Um, Starting five, no, the starting 11, no, the starting team for anybody that wants to have a team full of people that have optimism and hope for the future. Mm -hmm. And that was, it. while it shouldn't have been a surprise, it was really great to walk into Mark's lab, to walk into uh, 
know, Chris Krieger's here and Jess Reed's lab to walk into, you know, Terry Berry's here to uh, Michael Sussman. And I mean, you, you can just go on and on, Mark Richards. And there's just a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and, uh, and great technical skill and knowledge. Mm -hmm. With that thought in mind, uh, Dean Kate, let's talk a little bit about some of those uh, research projects that are ongoing. Every time that I get another opportunity to visit with somebody, I'm shocked and, and amazed at uh, what can be seemingly small, but can turn into big uh, emphasis, big changes potentially for agribusiness, for the farm, for the industry. Tell me a little bit about some of the highlights that you want this audience to be aware of that are ongoing at the College of Ag and Life Sciences. Well, uh, I should start maybe with just a brief introduction to what we do overall. Uh, I think a lot of people who have worked with WARF probably know the relationship between our biosciences and the beginnings of WARF and uh, some of the discoveries around uh, vitamins and uh, pharmaceuticals of various sorts. But that's, that's the and life sciences part of what we do. Uh, but on the agriculture part, it is, it's quite varied. We, uh, we have work going on that impacts both crop-based and animal-based agriculture, food, bioenergy, and a variety of other areas. And each one of those areas is replete with new technologies, with room for innovation, with uh, big data approaches. And so uh, we're, we're involved in, in all of those areas. Mm -hmm. And more and more, seeing connection from the consumer back to the farm getting closer and closer with food ingredients, what consumers want to see, practices, and how we do things. That's all part of your research team and what's going on on campus. Yes, and I'd add to that uh, the environmental impact of agriculture is certainly on the minds of consumers, and therefore it's on the mind of producers. So in the research that we do, uh, well, I'll give you an example of, of farm management. Uh, it's becoming more and more high tech with, with sensors and artificial intelligence and big data approaches to making uh, decisions about farm management. Uh, an example is a project in dairy science. Uh, Victor Cabrera is the principal investigator uh, and collaborating with other folks in CALS and in computer sciences to uh, integrate a lot of different data types uh, to come up with a, a good means to make decisions on the farm to maximize not only profitability and production, but also to uh, minimize uh, uh, environmental impact. And in his case, he's looking at greenhouse gases. So uh, it's a really exciting approach that um, I think we're going to see a lot more of. Let me ask just real quick for my own personal uh, sense. How many of you have an agriculture background of any kind? Good, because my point was going to be, when she talks about uh, artificial intelligence and things like that, some people that aren't familiar might say, oh yeah, right. But today, if you step into an, a modern tractor cab, you will very much feel like you are sitting in a science spy movie, because there's screens all around gathering some of that artificial intelligence. So like I said, when you see some of the research projects that uh, CALS is working on, it, uh, it kind of can scare you or motivate you on where we're going, depending on your demographic. With that being said, Tom Stills, my friend, uh, with Wisconsin Technology Center, tell me a little bit about who's nosing around the edges here with investment, what are they interested in, what projects are you seeing really uh, get momentum going right now? Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Pam, and, and thanks to Wharf and others for helping put this on, this gathering. So one of the things we do at the Tech Council is we try to track what's going on in the angel not only in Wisconsin, but some things nationally. And I was looking at AgFunder, which is a pretty good website on this topic. It looks like last year there was about $10 billion in ag investments and 924 deals around the country. And actually, I think some of these were around the world because it takes in some other regions. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty decent growth. There weren't any very few ag funds, if you go back 10, 12 years, there weren't many at all, and it was tough for those kinds of companies to, to find funding. Now, it's still fairly tough in Wisconsin, I'll be honest. It's because the core of investors here often come from other disciplines. They come from the health side, they come from the IT side, they come from the manufacturing side. They don't nef necessarily come out of, of ag. And so investors invest where they know, what they, and in, in what they know. So we've only seen 
at the angel and venture level, really a handful of deals in the last couple of three years. I don't think that means there's lack of interest. It can be though that it's tied to those investors and it can be that they're following other, uh, other routes. Uh, one of the things we run is the Wisconsin Governor's Business Plan Contest, and this year's one of the, the 12 finalists is, is an ag tech company. Uh, Amiga, Amoebagon is the name. Uh, they do work around uh, plant diseases, especially they've got some specific um, remedies, really, for potato rot and uh, apple diseases. So that's something that I think is exciting to see that that's coming on the scene. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's a emerging picture nationally and internationally um, and not as much as it should be here yet. Right, I will agree with you there. Food is a, is a global uh, item that everyone's discussing. You either have it or you don't, it seems. Uh, let's talk a little bit about an article that uh, Kate and Chris kind of co-authored that really brings these points home. And that is, and feel free to speak to one another instead of me, that is that we have to work a little bit better at bridging the gap of communication. Great things that are going on on campus could easily influence or excite investors if they knew about it. Tell them about that collaborative piece of work that you two did, and where did it come from? What, did you sit around one day and get irritated by lack of response, or was it something you saw, Chris, that uh, you knew another investor would be interested in if they only knew? How did this all get inspired for the two of you to collaborate? Um, for me, uh, Jean Ann called up and said, hey, we're planning to do this series. Uh, it'd be great if you and Kate agreed to do an article. And, um, and I said, who better to do it with? That's great. Uh, but uh, central to the point that I wanted to make in this, in this article, which is all about um, the realization the actualization of the Wisconsin idea. And the Wisconsin idea is all around innovation. And uh, for, for those that are around me much, they know that I have a definition for innovation. Innovation is the implementation of something new and beneficial, making it available in the marketplace. That's, for me, innovation. It is way different, way different from discovery, invention, creation. It is implementation to the point of making it available in the marketplace, which is, which is where I spend my time. And in order for me to spend that time effectively, um, I have to understand the marketplace, which is the place I lived in um, since graduating from my PhD program, lived in the marketplace. Um, that's something that I know about. And I know about what it takes to, to relatively go from a technology into the marketplace. What I don't really do very well at is invention, creation, discovery. And that's where the university really plays well. So for us to do this article, it was a, a really logical thing when Janan approached us because Chris and I are always having conversations, or we have been for several years. Um, at one point, he was done with the advisory board uh, that he mentioned earlier, and he said, wow, I'm going to need something else to do. And that lasted, uh, dwelled for about a half second of my, my mind before I said, say, Chris, would you like to be on the college's board of visitors? So that allowed us to continue a conversation. And um, I, I think the, the viewpoint that, that he mentioned is different in, in academia. For most of our academic researchers, they're starting from a standpoint of curiosity. How does this work? How does this fundamental biological process work? And from that comes uh, new discoveries. And then the next question is, well, hey, how could I put this to use? What could this be good for? And sometimes that's a long path to connect the dots. But what I appreciate about Chris is, as you can tell, he's very good at framing concepts. And um, one thing I've heard him say so often is, where is the value proposition? You know, what, 
what value does this bring? What is the hole that's being plugged? And for uh, those of us who are in the university and are motivated to, to discover new mechanisms or how things work, um, being able to have an industry partner to con connect us to a, a real world problem that, that, that would have a lot of impact if it could be solved uh, is, uh, is a really important bridge. And that's how we end up with, with some teamwork. Now, I, maybe, Chris, we should talk about the specific instance that you've been so interested in, which was um, when you got deeper into uh, supporting the Meat Lab and, and advocating for them and, and guiding them, uh, the question was, how can we get more value from an animal, right? How was that phrase? How, so the, the, the question is, what... Um, was, it was a very specific question, and then it turned into a general question. What's valuable in the pig that goes beyond protein as food? That question was posed to folks in animal sciences. What's valuable in the pig that goes beyond protein as food? And, um, and one of the professors came back with, after three months of study, he and his team came back with 10 different items. Another research lab came back with three different items that could be valuable. Um, and it was, it, was, uh, it was really exciting to see because we're no longer just dealing with the 1917 discovery of heparin in the mucosal layer of the small intestine of pigs. We're now dealing with the potential for specific immunoglobulin complexes that could come out of the pig that would influence human health. And the, um, the market value of, of meat protein that comes from the pig today is what? $100, $400 a pig? This one, one item on the list with a pharmaceutical application had the potential value of over $500 per pig. It was really cool to see. Imagine also taking the mesentery lining from the abdominal uh, space and turning it into a, a hernia patch. Imagine taking a kidney out of a pig and using it as a human transplant. Yeah. That, that, was, that was an inspiring set of, of questions, but really only became inspiring because of the expertise and deep, deep knowledge curiosity level that came out of the, out of the staff. But I would also argue that it was sparked by, by framing the question, and that sent us down quite a different path than we would have been on otherwise, probably without it. I gotta, I gotta ask Tom, you mentioned about how in previously uh, Wisconsin agriculture, agriculture in general hadn't gotten a lot of necessarily uh, big investor looks. Are we not sexy enough? <laughs> what is it? What do we lack to attract? Because I understand your point about you know medicine, medical, but you just heard Chris point out, we got that too. What do we have to do to try to convey this message. And I think Kate and Chris already pointed to, you know, breaking down some silos, but from your perspective and looking at venture capital moving around, are we not sexy? Yeah, I think we are, especially all the pig talk we just heard. <laughs> um, so a few more resources. Um, many of you might know the, the name Tara Johnson, uh, created yep. Tara's Way. Tara yep. runs the Food Finance Institute through UW Extension. That's a great resource. I think she's probably forgotten more about where to ha how to find that money than many people know. Uh, mo as I said, most of the VCs that are in this world are elsewhere. Uh, they're not here, but I think we're also seeing more corporate VCs get involved. Big companies that are in the food world and doing, doing their own investments. Uh, that, I think, is the, me, the more exciting, exciting part of the message right now, because I think they, those companies are aware of what's going on in Wisconsin. They're, they're out there shopping for deals. 
and it can be all over the place. I mean, as, as Dean Kate said, it's anything from robotics to precision agriculture uh, to what's going on in, in, in plant pathology and biotech, but also on the on the end with uh, with sensors, robotics, and, and a lot more. You know, AI is really certainly infiltra infiltrated. So it's out there. I think that. Um, you know, one of the things that the, the State Department of Agriculture could be encouraged to plant more seeds in that way in terms of getting the message out. I think that that's uh, beyond, I mean, there's a big internal audience of people who care about agriculture. Sometimes we got to, I think we need to talk a little more to others about what's going on. Right. Well, and I would agree with you. And some of the, the brightest spots, as you mentioned, are when companies try to empower themselves. If you've been paying attention at all, more and more food companies want to be in control of almost everything. They want to know exactly where, when, and how they're getting products. I just did a story with General Mills, 35,000 acre farm in South Dakota that they want to be in charge of completely, purely for their Annie's pasta organic grain supply. They are going direct, so to speak. Now, let's talk a little bit. Chris, you and I were chatting before this panel, and you said the other message is we have to remember there's no exclusivity on this kind of a, of a of think tank. We want everybody to try to engage, regardless of size, regardless of uh, direction. Flesh that out for me, that we're not, we have to make sure we're looking like we're not excluding anybody. Um, well, that, that says it. So let's not exclude anybody. The, um, um, Maybe the, maybe the point from that is um, spending a bit more time and energy gauging others. So um, if, if I'm Chris Krieger sitting there, if I'm, if I'm Chris and I'm working on specific projects in my lab and I've got some really great deep knowledge, science knowledge, um, I'm going to want to dedicate some percentage of my time being out in the field because that's really where you develop relationships and, um, and knowledge of applications and needs. It's, it's really having the broad ability to link knowledge with needs. And, and, and where do you do that? Create knowledge in the lab, the link knowledge with needs in the field. And in the field means in the hospitals, in the uh, retail grocery stores, in uh, companies manufacturing things, in, in the, uh, the marketers' domain, in their thought processes. And it's just finding those kinds of folks and, uh, and developing relationships with them. Kate, how do you think, uh, tell us about the challenges in motivating <clears throat> your researchers to do that. Uh, like you and I were talking, they're comfortable in their own orbit. They're comfortable in their own labs, uh, in their own uh, you know, population. But sometimes getting them to uh, make that extra step can be challenging, I'm sure. Uh, any thoughts or ideas on how that, how you might be working towards changing some of that culture or opening up more avenues with Chris's thoughts? Well, I, I would say in CALS, one of the beauties of the, our college is we have a complete spectrum of basic research to very, uh, very applied research. And many people already have that strong uh, ethos to, to extend the benefits of their research uh, out into the community to find application. Uh, the Wisconsin idea is something that gets them out of bed in the morning. So interaction between uh, different groups of people can help. I would also say the WARF programs help a lot, uh, showcasing innovation, um, and uh, th there's an annual awards process right now, which is really fun. Look at all the invention disclosures that have, have happened in an, any given year, and then they have the very difficult task to choose a small set of finalists for an award, and, and the one that, that gets it. it. Those are always really exciting stories, and I think hearing about other success uh, is a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. Now, just be keep in mind, in a couple minutes, you're going to get a chance to ask the panel questions. So start formulating those, and you'll see people with microphones in just a moment. Tom, your thoughts on that kind of 
Yeah, on, on your great exclusion point, or non-exclusion point, I guess, if you think about it, that's sort of the story of the founding of Wharf. If you go back to 1925, Harry Steenbach, professor here, figured out how to uh, use food with vitamin D through ultraviolet radi radiation. Started with monkey chow, I think, and then went to milk. And uh, I forget which company, but I want to say it was Nestle's wanted to buy it, lock, stock, and barrel. He said, no, I'd rather have this throughout the entire food system because rickets was such a problem, especially for, for children at the time. And so uh, Wharf is created as an arm's length organization. It's patented, it's licensed out broadly, and it's one of the success stories you can talk about. So I think that that, that strain follows through uh, a lot of that's happened here at the university. Is there anything that you noticed, Tom, from your vantage point that we could do, be doing better? Is it more conferences? Is it uh, uh, trying to inspire young minds with uh, more collaboration, more networking? I mean, I think they're doing it on their own, but sometimes doing it when there's a business presence watching them is uh, not happening as much. What do you see from your vantage point at the Technology Center that uh, other disciplines may be doing? Like I said, why aren't we looking sexy? Well, I, I think this has got a, this state has a great uh, reputation around health sciences, uh, from medical devices uh, to uh, biotech and a lot of things in between. That has been a very aggressive s sector. The software sector has grown a lot lately. Uh, ag sector, while you know it's been here from the beginning, it is uh, it, it's still learning. I think to take advantage of some of those consumer trends. Uh, one thing that's been great that I've seen at our conferences, in fact, well, next month, we're right across the street at Union South with our Entrepreneurs Conference is uh, the rise in student entrepreneurism on campus. That's been really strong here, as well as other campuses around the state. So I think people are beginning to tap into that. Um, you know, uh, it was mentioned, the, the late Mark Cook, I was fortunate enough to serve on a, on a corporate board with him. And, uh, you know, he was, he was that rare, example of a researcher and someone who could come up with these ideas but then put it into action as well. I'm sitting here looking at Rock Mackey who I think is another great example of that. Uh, there probably need to be more folks like that if they can be freed up in time and energy and other things. I think that's something university-wide could be of great assistance. Okay. Runners, why don't you get ready? If you've got questions, uh, I just ask that we've got two uh, one on each side, just uh, raise your hand and they'll uh, come over to you. And then just one question or one request. When you ask your question, give them a minute. The AV system takes just a moment to turn on, shall we say. So instead of me having to rephrase and, and restate your question, uh, how about we let you do that? So we'll start in the front row. Well, Tom, you said that uh, there's that there are not too many VCs here, venture capitalists. So. What is that which we need to do, either to create here or bring them here? Do we need to create a some kind of buzzword like Silicon Valley, Tech Valley, Milk Valley, whatever? So what is that which is missing here that uh, what could we create so that they say, ha ha, we want to go to Madison, we want to go to Wisconsin, because they are there to make money. and. Uh, so we need to think that what is that uh, which we could give them so that they will be successful here. Sure. Thank you. I could do a whole lecture on this, but I won't. But let me give you some quick figures. Uh, this year, there were 130 some deals in Wisconsin. Or this year, I should say 2017. The data we're collecting now, uh, 130 deals, roughly 225 million, somewhere around there. That places us probably about 25th in the country. Uh, we have been doing better, uh, especially since 2010, uh, in terms of the growth of those deals. A lot of it right now is Wisconsin's been a very good angel capital state. So angel networks like uh, Wisconsin Investment Partners or Golden Angels. We need more follow-on VC because there really aren't that many VCs in Wisconsin. However, there are things going on. I mentioned the corporate VCs. American Family is a great example here locally. Uh, others who are considering corporate fund-to-funds, 
uh, CUNA Mutual's gotten involved, Northwestern Mutual's gotten involved. Uh, we are seeing more investors, especially from Chicago. The coast, because the valuation of those companies are so high and the cost of living and all the cost of doing businesses, business is so high, those VCs are starting to pay much more attention to Wisconsin. So there, you know, there are some specific strategies that you can address. We do this by trying to invite them in for all these events and showing them the best that Wisconsin has to offer. Um, but you know, a lot like a lot of things in life, it's marketing, and so that's where we got to really constantly keep up on it. I like your Milk Valley. I think you're right, though. Just question: What I find is Wisconsin's got a lot going on in agriculture, but we're awfully doggone humble. And we don't do a very good job blowing our own horn. We may be knocking it out of the park with Kate's researchers, but we have a very difficult time mustering up that courage, like you said, to Mark Cook's credit, where you really actually will get out there and, and promote items. Uh, go ahead. So I'm grateful to hear the connection, as it's been uh, described, between innovation and research. And we're going back 100 years. I mean, that you could be talking about so I'm thinking of the Thanksgiving dinner table listening to Uncle Larry, who I grew up and realized was Larry Graber, Mr. Alfalfa, USA. <laughs> and Uncle Larry would talk about going into the field and talking to his relatives, the Grabers in Mineral Point, who wouldn't believe him as he talked about this new alfalfa and uh, using lime and the whole process of that relationship building. But that was a really family intimate thing, the connection between the campus and the farmers. And I'm curious about how that's being refocused upon and how necessary that is for everything that you're talking about now. And that truly is the essence of the Wisconsin idea, as very, you put it so well. Point. Very good point. Kate, you better jump on that kid. Yeah, I, I think that that personal connection is still very important. In fact, we do a lot to cultivate it in a variety of ways. Um, one, one is an academic program, I'll mention, which is older than my college by a, uh, two or three years, and that's the Farm and Industry Short Course. These are uh, kids who are usually recent high school graduates who, for one reason or another, don't want to do a four-year degree, at least at that point. They want to be very uh, hands-on with uh, farming, and they come for this abbreviated program, uh, 16 weeks, two years, uh, to each of two years. And the, uh, the reason it's really important to us, other than just our educational mission, is it creates a multi-generational connection to farm families. It's important for our research because we are knowing the issues that they are experiencing, and we are also able to get our research findings into their hands uh, really, really well. Uh, but there are a lot of other ways that we work closely with um, with agricultural producers. There's a group that I would call first adopters who just really like to be on top of the next thing and the next thing, and many of them uh, like to partner with our researchers for on-farm research. We have our own research uh, stations, but a lot of what we do is also uh, done with uh, directly on producers' farms, um, and which is uh, really useful to us, and, and I'm, I'm excited that they find it exciting uh, to partner with us. Um, I don't think we'll ever get away from the need to have those personal connections with people who are practitioners of, of what we produce. It is by curious, though. Your point's well taken. Extension's another one of those uh, flanges on the College of Ag and Life Sciences. And just this week, uh, another brand new smartphone app because farmers told the researchers they needed real time at their side information. So uh, like Kate said, there are researchers that are out there listening but uh, to your point, keeping that up and growing that uh, relationship level more is, is really critical. Do we have one back there? Go ahead. Kind of a follow on to that, we have so many undergrads who are graduating every year from the university, going all over the world, getting involved in industry, going to farms, talking to their families. How well do we think they understand the great research and the potential of the research going on at the university is, and can we make them better ambassadors for us? Well, I, I would say that <clears throat> um, undergraduates get involved in research personally, and that's probably the very best way to, to make them understand uh, what research can do. 
Um, I love at, you know, like last week when we were in the run-up to commencement, one of the things I love to do is to talk to graduating seniors and ask them, what made a difference for you? What turned a light on or changed your path? And um, many of them will talk about an experience they had outside of the classroom, especially doing research. And I think about half of the grads in, in my college have a mentored research, you know, real research activity that they've done, sometimes multiple ones uh, over many semesters. And they learn the process of research, they get turned on to it. So I think they are good ambassadors. Uh, Jennifer, that's a great question. I'm privileged, privileged to teach one class in the Department of Life Sciences Communications, which is a capstone class. And so they're seniors and grad students. And um, one of the things we talk about, and, and there's a lot of cross-discipline there, is their own work in undergraduate research. And uh, several of them over the past, you know, recent semesters have started a column in the Badger Herald about undergraduate research. And so um, I think that's, you know, one of the ways that we can, can help at least spread the, the message within this community. Well, and there's plenty of jobs for those folks. That's the... The, you know, like you said, industry is clamoring for the bodies coming off this campus. And uh, I've talked multiple times to professors, researchers, extension specialists that are constant, they almost have to shut their phone off because they're being approached for these graduates. So that's the other thing, Kate, is like you said, keeping them in your research programs as opposed to them uh, going into uh, agribusiness and some of that uh, community idea lost or that sharing prospect lost. But uh, do we have another? I don't want to take up. Yep. Okay. Go in the back. Go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for coming out. So I am a first year graduate student in engineering and I know several professors who would jump in an opportunity to collaborate with industry. Um, but there are a couple barriers to that. Uh, first is that if they have done work with industry before, industry has come to them. Uh, the second barrier is they don't know who to go to um, and it can also be seen as you know, maybe they're out of funding. Why are they asking those questions? So um, my question is, who are the gatekeepers um, in industry that we can approach, that the professors can approach and give their value proposition? Uh, That's a good point, Dad. I don't care, open field people. Uh, well, one great resource is, uh, resource is WARF itself. Uh, they have some great industry connections. UW Office of Corporate Relations is another we can be, I mean, I welcome any, any of the two profs that you mentioned to just give me a ring. Sometimes we know where to go uh, and rock. Uh, the ACE organization, I don't know if you've got a second to explain that, but that is really designed to, I think, encourage entrepreneurship and companies starting among faculty members and others. Yeah, you know, uh, ACE has merged with, uh, with WeSolve, and WeSolve is a graduate student and uh, postdoc organization that trains in entrepreneurship, but, but also gets them out consulting with startup companies right. and Wisconsin industries. So if you're a graduate student or postdoc, um, then you should uh, uh, go, go to the website, uh, www.wesolve.org. Uh, and it's a uh, not-for-profit uh, community organization that doesn't take money from the university. So, uh, so it has a, uh, a contract from, uh, from uh, Wedek mm -hmm. um, and, um, and donations. Great. So uh, here's another suggestion. And I know that um, we've used WeSolve on a project. That's been fantastic. Um, there are other organizations around the state so there is a, um, a consortium of company members that are designed to promote uh, food, and, food and beverage in the state of Wisconsin. It's called FAB Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, I think they have meetings once a month, and it's generally meetings that involve senior management of those companies. So become a member of FAB and go to the meetings. I mean, if you're a, a, a staff member in engineering or a postdoc in engineering or a grad student in engineering, what a great way to get introduced to the industry. I don't know whether you've already exhausted connections through your college, but um, all schools and colleges have a board of visitors, like what Chris serves on for us. And uh, those people are uh, already on board for the success of the unit. And if they don't have uh, opportunity 
employees in their own um, particular company, if they're in a company, they're deeply connected people, and your dean might be involved in other advisory groups or, or um, industry associations of various sorts. So uh, the relationships that we cultivate over years um, support us well, and they're really good starting points. Chris, maybe you can go back to that. To your point of some of us are long in the tooth. We have, uh, we've, we've spent our lifetime in this industry. We were talking about that when we were, before we started, Chris. We are at a sweet spot in our life, huh? You've got a great memory. Yeah, I know. Short, short but great. Short but great. So, but we were talking about this is a great time to be in production, in agriculture, in ag research, because the network may be small, but it's very tight. And people like Chris can make a lot of things happen just because he's been dedicated to the industry. So, so that is really a, a great question. And it's one that deserves individual attention and a strategy for you personally. But one of the factors that you could play into that strategy is this. What percent of the population is age 65 and above and have spent their entire careers working in an industry, gaining knowledge and experience, and are at a point where they have schedule flexibility and that's all they want to do is make a difference mm -hmm. and be true. valuable to somebody. It's very true. You wow. just have to touch one of those it's true. to get a phenomenal experience because at this stage, they're generally not interested in um, shaking you down for every penny you have. <laughs> What they're interested in doing is feeling great about their life and what they can do to make a difference going forward. And I think especially if that, um, I was going to say senior citizen, but uh, whatever. Yep. Uh, that describes us both. Um, has a UW connection because the desire to give back to this institution that made a difference for them, it, it, it's that extra something uh, for a relationship. Go to Ian Robertson and say, hey, I'd like to know who your board of uh, visitors folks are, and I'd like to connect with one. Mm -hmm. Do you see that, Tom? And do you see that kind of a situation? Oh, oh, sure. And uh, just building on what Dean Cade said about boards of visitors and engineering, for example, I'm on the industrial advisory board. And so that's set up sort of specifically for, for those kinds of purposes as well. So it's out there. I just took a call this morning from a campus related um, about a campus related discovery in the food world about oh, what are some of the things that you see that could be connected so you know it's out there you just you got to look a little bit oh a couple of more resources I should mention quickly coming online and it's a much more ecumenical fund is the Badger Fund of Funds they will have five regional funds around the state uh, also fairly ecumenical is the Bright Star Wisconsin Foundation, which is actually a nonprofit fund, kind of an oxymoron, nonprofit and venture capital, but that's how it works. And that's out of Milwaukee. So those are two things you can look up if you're thinking about uh, other financing routes. Very good. Do we have other questions? Yep, we've got, yep. Yeah, so I, I, have, I have two questions or, or possibly question comments. Uh, so I think there's two things that would really uh, improve the, um, the climate, if you like, of industry working with the university. One of them is to uh, have interns that go out to the companies. We really don't have a very smooth internship or even promotion of internship. There's no central point where a company can say, I'm looking for an intern and match them uh, with their needs. Uh, that would be really, really useful. And not only for the students, but for the companies because it, it, it makes a bond between the university and it should be at all levels. It should be undergraduate, graduate, postdocs. Um, and it, there should be a, also a, a, an inverse of that. There should be pretty easy ability for a uh, Wisconsin company to, to, to have a scientist to come into a lab and, uh, and not worry too much about the IP or, or, or even better, worry about the IP a lot and make sure you take care of that in advance. So, so hopefully we can have some programs uh, in that. And the other thing is it would be really a lot easier to have uh, and make it easier for the research contracts um, and the partnerships um, to happen more quickly. 
Uh, it's very easy to get a grant from the federal government that's you know smooth and it's a well-oiled operation, but it doesn't seem to be the case for a company wanting to do research with the university. We need to smooth that out. Another question? I have a question about, uh, you know, helping the startups. Because if somebody is a professor, a graduate student, or postdoc starts a startup, but they need money, they need some resources. And uh, I have found that, uh, well, I'm in Middleton, so, so I try to attract the companies to Middleton, but, uh, but it really doesn't matter. I'm more interested in the whole area. So um, I have found that uh, if, you, if a, there's a developer, he wants to build a building, you have a, or if you want to clear up a blighted area, you have a tax incremental financing and city can help very easily. Why can't we create something very similar, the program which has been uh, in, in Wisconsin since 79 or even earlier, and has been used very successfully to, to help these startups. I think uh, there's a, I, I don't know, there may be, I know there are some other programs, but we need something very similar to this where the cities and villages and towns, they have that flexibility and they can help the companies in a big way and that will make a huge difference. We won't be 25th or whatever number, we could be jumping to, you know, we won't have to be 50th. I think we may be among the top four or five if we were to do such a thing. I know it's legislature, but uh, unless we come together and find some mechanism and suggest, it isn't going to happen. But I'd like to get your thoughts that uh, what it could be and how to go about in doing that. So I'll, I'll just make a quick comment to that. Um, in the last 14 years, I've been involved in three startups. Um, so far, I get I get to talk smart about the first one because it's working. The second one is too young, and the third one's too young. We'll see how long we get to talk smart about that. But the the key to putting together a startup was being able to put together a purpose and a strategy that delivered more value than what we expected to get in return. And, um, and while each, each startup proposition is going to be different, it takes a great deal of work and effort to get the upfront purpose right. And no amount of community um, pot of funds or no amount of general overall uh, government support or, or philanthropic support will replace getting the proposition right and getting the people right that, that would do that. You know, we're in the uh, DeLuca conference room here, right? Uh, Hector DeLuca was famous for this saying. He said, and I'm going to quote it, starting a business is not a bed of roses. It's really hard work. Um, and the, the, the point is, it's really hard work. And there is a ton of money in the world available to fund great ideas. But you have to be able to communicate those great ideas. And maybe that's where we need to spend our time and energy. With that thought, I'm going to hold on questions. Uh, let's, uh, let's give the panel a chance to kind of, now that you've been asked questions and may have some additional thoughts, uh, we're on a clock. Kate, why don't you start with some closing comments on what you've heard, what you think after working with Chris and uh, coming together on some of those things. What are your, your thoughts now as we get ready to move on to it? Well, I, I liked a lot of the discussion. I think um, a lot of it to me centers around how do we best make connections? Um, because the more connections you have, the more likelihood you're gonna find common interests or complementary strengths. I like the ideas about more internships and more uh, science exchanges. 
Um, and any mechanisms we can come up with to foster that, I think, are a good idea. I, I should have mentioned earlier, you know, for us in the college, another interface is through some of our centers who, that are really devoted to uh, partnering with uh, different external communities. And sometimes the, the barrier, you know, to, of entry is, is low. Um, and uh, an associate dean in the college likes to say, we are the R&D unit for these, these companies, especially small ones that don't have the capacity to have it in-house. So uh, we should th think about how we can amplify uh, the contact through those as a starting place as well. Chris, what about you? I'm, I'm curious as to, now when you listen to some of these questions, are we getting better at facilitating people like you that are excited by what goes on on the college and want to take it to the next level? That seems to be a couple of the different questions is, make it easier, how do we find these people? Is it better than when you got engaged back when Molly was in the chair? Well, I, I think absolutely right, and, and the overall thought that's running through my mind is... No offense uh, to Molly. <laughs> okay, so the overall thought that's running through my mind is this. The, the greatest age of mankind is yet before us, is yet to come. And I think that Wisconsin has the best opportunity to influence that. It is a phenomenal set of um, optimistic, innovative, highly educated, hardworking people. And um, what, a, what a great time to be here. Tom, some thoughts? Yeah, I think particularly for this sector, uh, the innova innovation around agriculture and food is going to be greater at this time, I believe, than since the Green Revolution, sort of 1930s through the 1960s. So there's a great opportunity now with those, those ideas. I would say that Wisconsin is better situated now than it has been at any time in my memory. Um, if you look at things like uh, Wisconsin's investor tax credit program, it's called Act 255 as a shorthand. That's been great for a number of companies in all sectors. If you look at the uh, various loans and grants and things that can be done in a public-private way, those are uh, highly developed from where they were 15 years ago. Um, and there's no shortage of the opportunity to learn more. Conferences like the stuff that we do, contests, networks. Uh, you know, it used to be that there wasn't much going on, but now it's, it's, you know, it's almost every night. If you want to go out and look for it, it's there. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at, at things like uh, the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, a place where, where Tim Cooley, who's here, was once, was once uh, there. That has been really aggressive and it's grown. So the, the ecosystem around this is a lot better than I think it's ever been. So find ways to take advantage of it. Very good. Well, panelists, uh, let's give them a round of applause for their insights and uh, update on what we've got. <clears throat> Now, I think you heard one of the consistent messages as we've talked this last hour is networking. The money's out there. The enthusiasm's out there. Trying to get access to all that seems to be somewhat challenging. So I'll remind you again that at 5 o'clock, we've got a nice informal reception that's going to be going on. You got a great idea. You're looking for those uh, inroads on how you can get to the person that's the next level up. You can start with some of the folks at the front of the room and maybe more importantly, take a look to your left and your right. Maybe those are the critical partners that can be part of that startup that are ready to put in the work, that have the enthusiasm and uh, the excitement about the next uh, future phase of what Wisconsin agriculture is going to look like. And like I said, I'm sold. Hopefully we've uh, made it sound a little bit more sexy to those of you not so familiar with Wisconsin agriculture. And I'll look forward to reporting and covering on the fantastic research projects that are about to be funded and turn into mainstream America's next uh, serving on their plate or something we see across the farm fence. So please join us for the reception starting immediately after, just out in the foyer area. Again, thank you to my panelists. Thank you for allowing me to be your moderator. I'm Pam Yaki. Have a wonderful afternoon with 80 degree weather in Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you.